We are gathered here today to evaluate the integral from 0 to 1 of log x times log of negative log x over 1 minus x dx. And I know what you're thinking. The question was, how many logarithms do you want in your integral? And my answer was yes. So how on earth are we going to approach this thing? Well, the first thing I'd like to do is let negative log x equal t which will imply that x here equals e to the negative t, and this further implies that dx equals negative e to the negative t dt. Now, as x approaches 1, we get t approaching 0, and as x approaches 0, we have log x approaching negative infinity, so t is supposed to approach positive infinity. So that implies that the target integral i is now the integral from infinity to zero of log x, which is, of course, negative t. Then you have log of t over 1 minus e to the negative t times e to the negative t dt with another negative sign that cancels out over here quite nicely. However, we do have the limits of integration being infinity and zero, which does look kind of weird. And oh dear me, terribly sorry about that. Just give me a moment, I'm trying to move stuff around. So I'd like to switch them up to yield the integral from infinity to zero of t times e to the negative t log t over one minus e to the negative t dt. And this here looks like an integral on which I can invoke one of my favorite tricks, and that is the geometric series. So recall that 1 over 1 minus z can be expanded as the sum over k from 0 to infinity of z to the k provided the absolute value of z is less than 1. And this is clearly valid for z equal to e to the minus t on our interval of integration. So this implies that 1 over 1 minus e to the negative t equals the sum over k of e to the negative t to the k. So that's going to be e to the minus tk. And I'll plug this right into our target integral, yielding i equal to the integral from 0 to infinity. And it looks like I forgot a negative sign while moving stuff around. Anyway, so we have the negative of the integral from 0 to infinity of t times e to the minus t times log t times the sum over k of e to the minus tk dt. We can take all of this junk inside the summation operator because they're independent of the index variable k. So we have negative integral 0 to infinity sum over k from 0 to infinity of t times log t times e to the minus t times 1 plus k, where I've multiplied the two exponential functions and, of course, factored out the t. Now, there are clearly no problems regarding convergence thanks to this exponential term acting as some kind of damping factor. So we can switch up the order of the integration and summation operators and get the sum over k of the integrals from 0 to infinity of t times e to the minus t times 1 plus k log t dt, but I might as well go from 1 plus k to k, so I'm just going to transform the index variable a bit, shift it, and this implies that the target integral is now negative of the sum over the positive integers k of the integrals from 0 to infinity t times e to the negative t k log t dt. Now, this looks quite familiar. It looks almost like a Laplace transform or something derived from a Laplace transform. So recall that the Laplace transform of a function f of t is a function of s, is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus st f of t dt. But we can introduce an extra factor of t in the integrand if we differentiate with respect to the s parameter. So we have the derivative of the Laplace transform that I'm just going to call here Laplace prime. Laplace prime, that sounds interesting, almost like an Autobot. So step aside, Optimus Prime, it's Laplace prime's time to shine, whatever. So we have the Laplace prime of f of t 
equaling the integral from 0 to infinity, differentiating now partially with respect to s thanks to the Leibniz rule, e to the minus st, terribly sorry about that, f of t dt. So that means f of t is just going to be a constant, and we have the derivative of the exponential function, which is e to the minus st, and this negative t tags along because of the chain rule. We have f of t dt, which is pretty damn cool, because this now looks like the negative of the Laplace transform of a function t times f of t as a function of s. Okay, cool. So with that out of the way, that is, we know that what we have is in fact the derivative of a Laplace transform. What is wrong with me? That's it, those curly braces. So we know that what we have right now is in fact the derivative of some Laplace transform. So let me just copy this down there. And here we go. So wait a minute, we already have a negative sign baked in, which means that the target integral i is just the sum over k from 1 to infinity of the derivative of the Laplace transform, that is Laplace prime, as I'm calling it, of uh, what function exactly? Oh yeah, it's log t, terribly sorry about that, expressed as a function of k. Okay, cool. Now, wait a minute, what exactly is the Laplace transform of the logarithm? Well, that's easy. This thing is just negative Euler Mascheroni plus log s over s. So all I need to do is differentiate this thing. So differentiating with respect to s yields negative sign is still outside and I have s times 1 over s minus gamma plus log s times a 1 over s squared. Okay, that looks good. So we have negative 1 minus order Mascheroni minus log s all over s squared, or I could just expand with a negative sign and write this as Euler Mascheroni minus 1 over log squared plus log s over s squared, which looks dope. So wait a minute, what exactly do we have again? Oh yeah, we have i being equal to the sum over k of gamma minus 1 over k squared plus log k over k squared. So using the linearity of the summation operator, we have gamma minus 1 times the sum over k from 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared plus the sum over k of log k over k squared which do look quite familiar. In fact, this thing is, of course, zeta 2, which we know from the Basel problem, is pi squared over 6. But we can also do something about this log term, because notice that this thing is, in fact, the derivative with respect to s of the sum over k of 1 over k to the s evaluated at s equal to 2, and in fact, there needs to be a negative sign to balance things out, as in this thing is in fact negative zeta prime evaluated at 2. So we have zeta 2, and we have zeta prime of 2, which is another Pandora's box that I really should make a video about. Anyway, today it will serve to, it will serve enough to, or it will suffice to actually just reference it. But I will make a future video. And in case I forget, do keep reminding me in the comment section. Anyway, so we have gamma minus 1 times pi squared over 6. And zeta prime of 2 is actually interesting in that it is also related to zeta 2 itself. And in fact, quite a few constants. So it's actually equal to the euler mascheroni constant plus log 2 pi minus 12 times the logarithm of, an, of another very special constant, A, called the glacier kinkman constant. I hope I did not butcher that name. Times zeta 2, which is just, well, pi squared over 6. So that means we can actually factor out pi squared over 6. So we have pi squared, uh, we have gamma minus 1, or rather, wait, I might forget this. So pi squared over 6, gamma minus 1, and what else? Wait, this was supposed to be a negative. Negative sign over there minus gamma, minus log 2 pi, plus 12 times log a, 
the GAN was cancelled out. I know, disappointing. This has happened quite quite often. So this is pi squared over 6 times 12 times log a minus log 2 pi minus 1. So again, it is sad to see the order mask only constant go. But at least we have some really nice looking constants. I mean, we have a and we have log 2 pi and we have 1. And I could just write this in a rather absurd way, but hey, this is maths 505 we're talking about. So we can write this as log of a to the 12th power uh, over 2 pi e, which doesn't really look half bad, does it? Okay, cool. That was awesome. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram as well. Thank you. See you next time.